Luke chapter 21, a beginning to the Olivet Discourse, beginning in verse 5. The Olivet Discourse is the longest single teaching of Christ in the book of Luke. Curiously, it is shorter, that is the Olivet Discourse is shorter in the book of Luke than it is in Matthew and Mark, less detailed and does not contain all of the same messages of the longer discourses in Matthew and Mark. But it is condensed, but I think we can make good progress on what is difficult to understand, more so next week than this week, it is not always clear what our Lord is referring to, and I will try to help with that as we move through the passage. Luke chapter 21, verses 5 through 19. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, As for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another, which will not be torn down. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? He said, See to it that you are not misled, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Then he continued by saying to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes, and in various places plagues and famines. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends." And they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. We are at midpoint in Passion Week. The disciples and their Lord have left the temple passed over across eastward to the Mount of Olives and have sat down together. We gather this knowledge from Matthew and Mark. It is called the Olivet Discourse because it was given on Mount Olivet. As they sit, the temple directly across from them, undoubtedly at this time, dazzling in its glory and and magnificence, the disciples comment on the temple's magnificence. They speak of the stones and the votive gifts. Just a glimpse of Herod's temple. It was twice the size of the Acropolis in Athens, a perimeter of almost one mile. It was known throughout the ancient world as one of the wonders of the world. 
Even a Roman historian commented on its magnificent opulence. Gold doors literally reflected the light of the sun. And perhaps that is the startling scene that causes the apostles to comment on the glory of the temple. The stones. Well, archaeology has revealed to us the unbelievable statistics of the length of some of the stones. Some of them were over 40 feet in singular piece, weighing almost 600 tons, and yet they were finally crafted to fit into other stones to make a perfect seal and perfect walls for the temple and the court of the Gentiles. So indeed, people came from all over the world to worship there, but also to look at what had become a figure of architecture extraordinary even in the Roman era. The disciples comment on this magnificence. But it is Christ who initiates the discussion of the temple's destruction, undoubtedly surprising the apostles who merely were talking about its opulence and magnificence. Christ suddenly interjects the fact that the temple itself will be thrown down so that even these massive stones will not be connected to each other anymore, but torn down in destruction of judgment. Naturally, they are curious and ask two questions. Verse 6, they want to know when this will take place and what, if any, signs will precede the destruction of the temple. It is very important in this discourse to know again what they are asking. When will it take place and what will be the signs? Both questions have to do with the destruction or desolation of the temple. None of the questions initially have to do with the second coming of Christ. They are both questions about the destruction of the temple and what may be allied with that, the destruction of Jerusalem. In the minds of convicted Jewish patriots, it is unthinkable that the temple would or even could be destroyed. And so the disciples are alarmed and ask when it will happen and what will be the signs. And in verse 8, Jesus begins to answer their questions. In verses 8 and 9, there are two areas in which that, that will not take place before the destruction happens. And Jesus recounts these. First, others will imitate him in claiming to be the Christ. There will be many who claim to be Christ and claim to herald the end. They will say, their speech is, I am he, that is, I am Christ, and the time is near. So there will be individuals impersonating Christ or claiming to be Christ, claiming also that the time is near. These are messianic pretenders and claimer, claimants who proclaim a message. The time is near. The destruction of the temple is at hand. Well, we have a historian who comments on this. Josephus, who was in fact a Jewish general during the war with Rome from A.D. 66 to 70, he, Josephus that is, 
was a general in the Jewish forces. And he later became a patron of the Romans. And he later wrote a book called The History of the Jewish War. And in that book, he talks extensively about the number of those who appeared on the scene at the crisis of the destruction of the temple who claimed to be the Christ. This means that if the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple are a mirror of the last times, of the greater destruction that will come before Christ, these verses we'll visit next week. But if the destruction of Jerusalem is in fact a mirror of what will happen at the end times before Jesus returns, then we have almost certainly a prediction that many will be pretenders to the throne of Christ, announcing that the end is near, and that the fact of the matter is that God's people are not to be deceived. So that Jesus is framing his answer to the question when and what signs with helpful information that will benefit his disciples as they live through those times themselves. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus says that this generation that is the current generation in which the apostles are living, will not pass away until this takes place. So in the lifetime of the apostles, the, temp the temple of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Messianic pretenders and claimants will come. And Jesus' disciples are not to be deceived. Later, Jesus will tell us why we should never be deceived by messianic pretenders. And anticipating that teaching, Jesus says that his coming will be clear. It will be like lightning passing from the east to the west. So universally clear that none will need to say the time is near. His second coming will be evident to all. Therefore, do not listen to messianic pretenders and claimants who falsify a claim and who pretend to know the prophetic end of the temple of Jerusalem and ultimately later the end of time. God's people are not to be deceived. However, there will be many events and episodes that will cause fear before the destruction of the temple. Verse 9, When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. These things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. So, we may look to understand that a normal course of warfare will take place before the destruction of the temple. In other words, Jesus is saying that the ordinary course of human life under the sun is fraught with warfare. Warfare occurs all the time amongst warring peoples. If you think of your own life, think back to childhood to the present day, and all of the wars that have taken place since your childhood. If you are advanced in years, you can think back all the way to world wars. And these wars have never signal, signaled the end. Although we know from historical record that in the Great War and the war to end all wars, World War I, Many, many a multitude of believing Christians thought that this war, to end all wars, this great world war taking place in the middle of the second decade of the 20th century, that this war 
was a harbinger of the end time. But Jesus is saying here, there are wars and disturbances. They occur with regular frequency, that repetitive phrase. And with regular frequency, individuals interpret warfare and the destabilization of human life that is the result of warfare, people interpret that warfare as a sign or a portent of the end of time, or in this case, the destruction of Jerusalem. But Jesus says the time is not at end, and his counsel is not to be terrified by wars. So there are two things that Jesus says. There will be false Christs, there will be many wars. But the church of God is not to be deceived, and the church of God is not to be terrified. She is to wait patiently as we will see his counsel in a while. The Bible tells us in verse 10 that Jesus continues to explain and answer their question what signs there will be before the destruction of the temple. Incidentally, or coincidentally, this seems very clearly to argue for an early date for Mark. If the war with Rome was 66 to 70, although that war extended well into the 70s as the Romans conquered entrenched places like the fortress at Masada, this took place years after the, the, the destruction of Jerusalem. So really you have a span not just of A.D. 70, but the war began in 66 and stretched to at least 73, a space of almost eight years. But Jesus says here that his church is not to be deceived and is not to be terrified that these things will happen, but the end is not yet. He says specifically, the end does not follow immediately. And in verse 10, he continues to teach. He speaks now of international warfare, which appears to be a continuation of his thought, that nation will rise against nation, there will not only be local conflicts, but international upheaval. And in fact, kingdoms will rise against kingdoms. This too adds to his previous discussion that there will be widespread warfare before the temple is destroyed. And again, we can consult not only Josephus, a Jewish historian, but Roman historians for the number of wars and conflicts that took place prior to the Jewish-Roman War of A.D. 66 through 73. He now begins to spread out his description answering their question of what will be the signs by referring to geological phenomena. That is to say that before the end the seismograph will move, and it will not move slightly, it will move greatly. There will be great earthquakes. He now diverges from the discussion of international warfare to natural phenomenon, or we might say extraordinary but natural phenomenon. There will be great earthquakes in the earth, there will be plagues and famines in various places. And though the earthquakes will appear to be not only great in intensity, but wide in distribution, that is geographical distribution, these famines and plagues will take place in various locations so that they will not be universal but they will be in different geographical locations. Nevertheless, they will contribute to the fearfulness among human beings and the destabilization of human life as there are insufficient resources 
and there are sickness and plagues that take, take place disordering human existence and especially causing universal fear in the hearts of all mankind. And the drama is building. We not only have international warfare, but we have great earthquakes and we have famines and plagues. Once again, it is the view of many interpreters that these things that preceded the destruction of the temple mirror the end, the end of time when Jesus will come again. And again, we will move to that section next week. This is a lengthy enough section as it is. Lastly, there are astro astrological phenomena. There are events that take place in the heavens. And here now we have an important part of the Olivet Discourse, most plainly in Mark and Matthew, but also here in Luke. Because when the prophets were foretelling the destruction of the first temple, here again is what we call the second temple. You're familiar with the phrase second temple Judaism. That is from the time of the building of the second temple to the destruction of the Herod's temple about which we are speaking this morning. That is that period of history from roughly A.D. 500 or actually the middle of the, of the 6th century B.C. all the way to the 1st century uh, of the, the Common Era. This is called Second Temple Judaism because it coincides with the existence and the lasting um, utilization of the Second Temple. And that is a period in which the Judy, Jew, Jewish history was variegated and different. Many ruled over them and kept them and, and subordinated them. The Persians, the Greeks, Seleucids, for example, and later the Hasmoneans themselves reduced Jewish to a servant state. These things all took place during Second, Second Temple Judaism, and this is the Second Temple now that is going to be raised, and in Jesus' famous words, not one stone, even if they do weigh nearly 600 tons, not one stone is going to be left upon the other of the second temple. But as prophets foretold the destruction of the first temple, they often used figurative language, poetic language, metaphorical language of great signs in the heavens to describe the judgment of God that would come upon Jerusalem and the first temple. And we call that often the Solomonic Temple. Many of them, Jeremiah tells us this, felt, them, felt that the first temple was inviolable, that no one would ever destroy the first temple because God would not permit it. So was the belief of many Jews. So was the belief of many Jews about the second temple, that God would not permit anyone to destroy it. That's why earlier in verse 5, excuse me, in verse 6, Jesus alarms his disciples by saying one stone will not be left upon another. They did not believe that the, or perhaps a better way to describe it, they did believe that the temple was inviolable. But when the prophet spoke, Isaiah for example, of the destruction of the first temple, he used figurative language of signs in the heavens to describe the physical destruction of Jerusalem and the first temple. Therefore, and the debate is very wide, therefore many interpreters believe that when Jesus refers in all three synoptic gospels to signs in the heavens, as he does in verse 11, astrological phenomenon here, terrors and great signs from heaven, he is using figurative language to describe judgment. 
And he has as a precedent for that the Old Testament prophets who describe, who depicted the destruction of the first temple. They used metaphorical language about the heavens to describe earthly judgment upon the temple. And perhaps Jesus is doing it here. However, Josephus says, for what it is worth, and he is largely viewed as a credible historian, that when the second temple was destroyed, the destruction about which Jesus is speaking here, there were irresistibly magical signs in the heavens. Now, whether or not that took place, historians debate. Whether or not he is referring to literal great signs in the heavens here, interpreters debate. But one way or another, it is clear that there are distressing and disturbing signs that add to the already destabilization of human life that has occurred because of warfares, famine, plagues, and earthquakes. Adding to that, there appear to be phenomena in the heavens that destabilize human existence all the more. In other words, Luke, less than Matthew and Mark, in other words, Luke is citing Jesus as building, as he moves through the Olivet Discourse, building those things which make for great unrest and terrifying fear among human beings prior to the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem, and if indeed it does, mirroring the second coming of Christ. Human fear and terror. That is why this discourse, especially in all the synoptic gospels, tells the disciples of Jesus not to fear. That although events appear to be totally out of control, God is still in control. And believers are not to fret, though there are earthquakes, signs in the heavens, famines and plagues, and international warfare. They are not to be unsettled, but are to look with confidence to God. By the way, this is extremely helpful when placed in the context of much American theology today. Beginning in 1970, with the publication of the late great planet Earth, we have been hearing for over 50 years that the wars around us, the earthquakes that have happened, and other destabilizing events herald the second coming of Christ. But it is proved not to be the case. And had we read this with care and sobriety, we would not have been misled by those books and those films and those widespread crusades on eschatology which tell us that the coming of Christ was certainly just around the corner. Jesus says here clearly, he says, verse 12, before all these things ever happen, even before these terrifying signs that Jerusalem's temple will be destroyed, they will lay their hands on you. And so verse 12 is, a, is a, another sign that will take place prior to the destruction of the temple. Remember the question they had asked. When will it happen and what will be the signs? When will what happen? When will the temple be destroyed? As horrifying as that thought was to an Orthodox Jew, nevertheless Jesus says it will take place. And of course it did. Verse 12 reminds Christians much of this again next week. But here we have a direct statement that persecution will take place both by Jews and Gentiles for his name's sake. The persecution that will take place will be for the sake of the name of Jesus, the end of verse 12. But we know that the persecution is by Jews and Gentiles because of the mention of synagogues in verse 12 and also the mention of kings and governors, a reference obviously to 
to Gentiles. And if we remember Paul's statement in the book of Corinthians, he speaks of being flogged by the Jews five times and flogged by the Romans three times. All of this well before the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, referring to the period of persecution of Christians before the temple was destroyed. And Jesus says, you are to be prepared for persecution. That persecution is going to take, for my, for my name's sake, persecution is going to take place before the end. You are to be prepared. And unusually, this is highly unusual, there are two responses, the Christian, actually one is a non-response. But there are two, we'll speak of them as responses, there are two responses to persecution that Christians are to endeavor to implement. And they're both a little bit surprising. Not in the counsel that is given by Jesus, but in the response to persecution. And the first response to per persecution is, verse 13's first sentence, it is an opportunity for your testimony. And that possessive pronoun indicates they individually will be accountable to give a testimony under the persecution that will take place before the destruction of the temple. So that before the temple is destroyed, when they are hauled before synagogues and prisons, the physical nature of their being arrested is clear from the words in verse 13, they will lay their hands on you. They will imprison you. They will persecute you. But your response is to view this activity, obviously malevolent on the part of the persecutors, but Christians are to view the persecution that took place in the early chapters of Acts. We see, again, the apostles imprisoned by the Sanhedrin. We see Jerusalem itself evacuated by most Christians because of the intense persecution. This takes place before the destruction of the temple. But the response of Christians is to view it as a, an, an opportunity for testimony for the name of Jesus. And we have that clearly shown by the apostles. They certainly took Jesus' counsel to heart and we find them hauled before the Sanhedrin, for example, and they say, if you're looking for an answer for how this man was healed, let it be known to you it is in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And they specifically invoke the name of Jesus as a testimony to his resurrection as they are brought before the synagogues, the prisons, and the... Um, places of, of persecution, whether they are incarcerated, whether they are uh, physically assailed, they use it as an opportunity to testify to the resurrection of Jesus. And so all this should be settling in the mind of the Christian reader. The Christian reader is saying, hey, I'm not supposed to be misled by all these front page headlines that the end is near or by this false prophet who says he is Christ. And these wars that are every night on the news, they are not to terrify me because the end is not yet. And even though there are plagues and famines, earthquakes and phenomena in the heavens, still I am not to be shaken by that. Even when I am persecuted, I have been told that before the end, I will be persecuted, and I am to take this as an opportunity for testimony. Now what I was referring to non-response. And I say this from, a, from a, a pastor's perspective, especially. Those who are engage in public speech in their vocational callings, for example, pastors, but also, another example might be a trial lawyer. They have to address juries. 
and oftentimes they can be eloquently persuasive and perhaps not truthful, but nevertheless, they engage in speech as a matter of their vocational calling. And what all of us know, but I have to say should know because it's apparent that some don't, but all of us should know, all of us, that is those who, whose vocational calling involves regular public, public speaking, we should know that we ought to prepare beforehand. And that preparation beforehand involves premeditation, uh, perhaps the formulation of an orderly outline that will give the points that are to be discussed and presented. And oftentimes people who are inexperienced in public speaking will use the aid of a PowerPoint. But even that PowerPoint has to be, the, the dots have to be composed and the lines of presentation have to be thought out. But Jesus says something that is surprising here. He says, when they haul you in, in verse 14, make up your mind. Verse 13, we had an opportunity for testimony. Now in verse 14, he says this. This is his counsel to us. Make up your minds not to prepare beforehand. And that's almost counterintuitive because I know that if I'm going to have to speak somewhere, I have some anxiety until I'm calm in my mind that I have the material thought out. And even though I don't put it down on paper, I have it organized and, and outlined in my mind. And I know what I'm going to say. And it is wise, so I think, often in points that may be difficult to prepare beforehand certain sentences, certain paragraph arrangements, that help you to explain something clearly. So for Jesus to say, I don't want you to prepare beforehand, as I've said, it's almost counterintuitive because what I want to do, if I know in 10 minutes I have to give a public testimony for Jesus Christ, I'm going to spend that much of that time, as much of that time as I can, getting aside and putting in my thoughts in order. We often think of that even as, as, as individuals who may not speak publicly on a regular basis. We often think of getting our thoughts in order. And this is especially true at a funeral because there's so many variables. Who is going to be there you don't know. What is going to be the percentage of people there who are Christians? You have to make an educated guess. And you have many variables. So you want to have prepared beforehand, perhaps, um, two or three different things you might say or might not say. And then you want to have that prepared beforehand. Jesus says, I don't want you to worry about even preparing beforehand. Because I will give you, literally it says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom. Jesus promises personally to assist the incarcerated and the persecuted Christian, Jesus promises personally to give that individual words, a mouth, that is speech, that the persecutors, he says, will not be able to resist or refute. He will give to us irrefutable wisdom, in other words, to answer those who persecute us. So let's walk through this one more time. We hear people saying it's the end of time and we become a little anxious. But then there is war everywhere and particularly in our media-driven age, we're able to see those wars right on the television screen and they're anxiety-provoking. But then there are plagues then there are famines, then there are earthquakes, then there's astral signs in the heavens, then there's persecution of our brothers and sisters. There is an ascending ladder of anxiety-provoking things that are taking place. 
But in all of our efforts so far this morning, we see Jesus telling us how we are to respond or in the moment of deliverance telling the apostles how they are to respond. Do not be deceived. Turn the television off and say that's not true. We're not to be anxious about the warfares. There's wars and rumors of wars as it's put in Matthew and Mark. Always don't necessarily divine that the end is yet. There are earthquakes that remind us of really from the center of the earth that we live on a, on a planet that is stable because of the grace of God. There are many things within the, within the um, I wouldn't call it infrastructure, but there are any, many things within the earth that can make for destabilization. One such event is an earthquake. And once again, he says a great earthquake, so that Richter scale, scale is moving over to the right side of the graph quite far as Jesus as describing it. And then fright of frights, as the prophets depicted judgment, as signs in the heavens, this really makes one nervous. So all of these things described are things that provoke a state of unrest. Persecution certainly is not a calming and tranquil thought either. But Jesus says, I don't want you to prepare him. Dan, I don't want you over there in the corner going over these things and figuring these words you're going to say. Just trust me, I'll give you the words to say, and they won't be able to refute them. But now if there's a funeral, I usually fast before all funeral, fun funerals. And I prepare carefully for funerals because there's so many variables, but also because it's so important. It's so important that people hear the gospel. But you don't want to browbeat them. And there's some sophistication and finesse involved in working those things in without compromising them and being straightforward and clear, but yet in a way that, if not winsome, at least is clear and persuasive. So I premeditate. The success of public speaking is preparation. Jesus says, don't prepare beforehand. And this is, as I've said, uh, for the third time, counterintuitive. But Jesus says, I'm going to give you the words to speak. And in the other two Gospels, he speaks of the Holy Spirit. And many interpreters question and wonder why Jesus does not refer to the Holy Spirit here in this, why Luke does not refer to the Holy Spirit in this passage, because Luke is usually quick to mention the Holy Spirit. But for some reason, he doesn't. Matthew and Mark say the Holy Spirit will give you words. Jesus says, I will. And the only explanation for that, I think, is that the functions of Jesus and the Holy Spirit often coalesce in Scripture. One can be substituted for another that their activity and function is so closely identified with one another. They're separate persons of the Holy Trinity, but often their activity or ministry is similar. And so for some reason, Jesus has chosen and Paul, and excuse me, Luke has chosen here to use his own first person singular, I will give you. So, by the way, they say, they meaning statisticians and those who comment on such things, that one of the most anxious things for people is public speaking. That is, if you ask people, what are the things that make you nervous? One that always ranks at the top is public speaking. It's really not, it, it, it's not always so, but, but it is so as far as the general populace. Jesus saying, I don't want you to worry about that. You hear that rumble? That's an earthquake. Watch that Richter scale. I don't want you to worry. Hear about that nuclear threat or that missile that North Korea is sending up? right on the borders of South Korea and right headed toward Japan. Come on. Don't worry about it. Christians are being persecuted in the Middle East. Don't want you to worry about it. I'm afraid to speak. Don't want you to worry about it. I'm going to take care of you. 
And then he concludes by something that's the saddest of all. You see, I've had many verses and we've carefully looked at each one. Verse 16, family and friends, kith and kin may betray you. Now we're coming down to the, there's been sort of an escalation of destabilizing, uncomfortable phenomena taking place. It's sort of escalated to the point now we're persecuted. But this is the worst of all. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. So there's betrayal and, and there's betrayal and martyrdom. That now of all the things we've talked about so far, that makes me the most nervous. Jesus says, I don't want you to worry about it. But it is, it is heartbreaking to be betrayed by family and friends. It's one thing when a stranger does something, but when a family member does something, it's, it's extremely painful and difficult and often makes us want to throw our hands up in the air and just quit. But Jesus is saying here, friends and family, kith and kin, as I've said, are going to betray you. I don't want you to worry about that. What I want you to do is he'll say in our last verse, I want you to endure it. But he's warning them now, this is coming. And if this is a mirror, as most interpreters think it is, if what takes place before the end of Jerusalem is a mirror of what takes place before the coming of Christ, then we may expect that there will be those who defect from the faith and turn state's evidence and lead by betrayal, lead their own family and relatives to the doorway of death. So that's a hard thing to take. Some of you, Dr. Campbell, you're going to do well with the earthquakes. He knows all about them. That's not going to upset him, but that may upset some of us. We're not as familiar with that phenomenon. But having a parent or a child or a sibling betray you to the doorway of death, that's going to upset all of us. And by the way, that happened during the Inquisition. That's happened throughout church history. And Jesus' response is, not only... Will you be betrayed by family members? But you're going to be universally hated for my sake. So there's betrayal, there's martyr, martyrdom, and there's universal hatred. We've come to the top of the ladder. Now, you read the Bible and you've read this passage especially since you're supposed to have heard it for the last two weeks. But we have what appears to be verses 16 and 18 in conflict. Why so? Well, we have it plainly stated that some will be martyred. And then in verse 18 we have, that's in verse 16, then in verse 18 we have, not a hair of your head will perish. And so these statements by Jesus appear to conflict. And they certainly confound certain people. And I think the key to opening this and clearing the door of understanding here is that we tend to, to overthink that. What Jesus appears to be saying is the general pattern is going to be don't worry because I'm going to protect you and not a hair of your head is going to perish. That's the, that's the general counsel in the overall destabilized, nervous, anxious, unsettled situations that have been described. Anxiety, fear, but don't worry, 
even if your family betrays you, not a hair of your head is going to perish. That is in keeping with the context of the rest of the passage. But Jesus is also saying there are going to be those of you who are going to be martyred, so be aware that that's going to take place. It's not so much a confliction that should confound us as it is two perspectives on the same happening. We are going to receive the protection of God. Not a hair of our head should perish, but God has privileged some to endure martyrdom. And you have that, that very fact borne out in the fiercest of Roman persecutions at the turn of the fourth century, where you had confiscation of sacred books, the burning of churches, and the beheading of many Christians. But relative to the general populace, most of them had their lives spared. And so what we do when we go into persecution, we recognize, we trust that God is going to protect us and not a hair of our head is going to perish. That's what Jesus says. We also recognize that he has ordained that some will taste martyrdom. And we expect and recognize both of those things. But the attitude that incites and motivates us to faithfulness is given in the final verse. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. The word lives is the word souls. By enduring all of these things that we've talked about, and no, we haven't. All of these things that Jesus told his apostles were going to happen before the end of Jerusalem, all of these things are going to take place and happen before that time. Jesus says that we are to endure. And by enduring, we are going to possess, or rather we are going to save our, our souls are going to be saved through Jesus Christ because we have endured the persecution that is the apex of what we've talked about in terms of last days. I hope it's not too many times, but this is the last time. Let's review. Antic, false, false prophets who mislead, we're not going to be deceived. Disruptive International warfare, we're not going to be afraid. Mighty and strong earthquakes, that's not going to unsettle us. Plagues and famines in various places, we're not going to be discouraged. Geological phenomena, the floor literally becomes unsteady underneath us. We're not going to be confounded or confused. We're prepared. We're not going to be afraid. We may have natural fear, but our faith, as Jesus says, you're going to endure that because you know that these signs precede the end. Persecution. We are going to take it, remember, in two ways. It's going to be an opportunity to give our testimony of faith in Jesus Christ and it's, we're not going to need to premeditate. And all that worry that you had in high school speech class suddenly floods over you like, like a, a drowning in a pool. I've got to get up in front of the class tomorrow and speak. And you couldn't sleep all night. Jesus said, you don't have to do that. I'll give you the words when you stand before the people who are going to persecute you. But then Jesus says, you're going to have to watch your heart because even family members may betray you, and that is really going to hurt. And some of you will be martyred, and that's going to end your life. But in all of these things, I've counseled you over each one. I don't want you to be unsettled because not a hair of your head is going to perish. And your 
patience, in your endurance, and the word means to remain under, as we remain under with faith the conflicts that he has described that precede the end, as we remain under faith, God is going to give us the strength and the grace to endure those things, to remain faithful until the end, and in that endurance we are going to possess our very own souls. So, this is what Jesus says after rocking them back on their heels by telling them that the temple is going to be destroyed. Unthinkable. But it's going to take place. It's going to take place in your lifetime. Here are the signs that precede it. Here's how you're to be prepared to handle those things. But in all of them, there is a trust that God is in sovereign control of all things and His people can trust Him to care for them so that not a hair on their head perishes. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we are grateful for the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are grateful for His counsel and wisdom that He makes known to us through His Holy Scriptures. And we pray now, Lord, that You might graciously uh, prepare us and help us to view all of these things through the lens of Scripture and to remain calm and to remain confident in Your protection and Your sovereign care of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.